Nicola is the one thing that remains a mystery to me. Nicola is one of the most intriguing and enigmatic characters in Elden Ring. Despite the lack of his physical presence in the game, he appears to be a very important character, figuring into the storylines of several NPC quests and two main areas and shardbearers. But more than that, he's interesting in the grander scheme of things because he seems to be the only person with enough power or knowledge to be able to reject the influence of outer gods, something which arguably even Merica can't do. In this video, I'm going to examine Mikola and his motivations from a variety of different angles, including cut content and connections to external sources like Berserk and the alpha version of Dark Souls 3. But first, let's begin with an item description, the Remembrance of the Rot Goddess. The description reads, Mikola and Melania are both the children of a single god. As such, they are both Empyreans, but suffered afflictions from birth. One was cursed with eternal childhood, and the other harbored rot within. This description has provoked some controversy among lore hunters. Most people interpret this to mean that the twins are Empyreans because they were born to a single god, and I agree that this is probably the most natural interpretation of this description. However, reading it in this way doesn't necessarily imply, as some people assume, that the only way to be an Empyrean is to be born to a single god. It just means that in this particular case, being born from a single god was the deciding factor. For example, it could just mean that being born from a single god meant that the twins were especially powerful, and it's because of that power that they were made Empyreans. It's important to make this distinction because many people have taken it for granted that being an Empyrean is an immutable characteristic that one is born with. However, Rani says that she was once an Empyrean, and that she cast aside her Empyrean flesh. This implies that Empyreanhood may be tied in some way to the body, and that one can stop being an Empyrean, removing the fate or responsibilities that come with that title, by destroying their body, if nothing else. If someone can choose to stop being an Empyrean, this suggests that it's not an immutable characteristic. Empyreans are chosen by the two fingers, and it seems to me more likely that this is what makes someone an Empyrean, that the two fingers bestow the title of Empyrean upon people they deem worthy. I've looked at the Japanese version of this item description, and in attempting to translate it, I got a slightly different reading. The way I read it, it seems to say that, as for Mikola and Melania, they were the children of one god, or possibly the children of the soul of one person. Therefore, although they were god people, or Empyreans, their life was fragile. The difference being that, in this interpretation, the emphasis is on the fact that, because they were born from one person, their lives were fragile, despite them being Empyreans. For those who are interested, the reason I'm reading it that way is because of the position of the Wa and Ga particles. I'm not fluent in Japanese, however, so I'd be happy to be corrected on that point. Either way, I don't think the English description means that the only way to be an Empyrean is to be born of a single god. This is further supported by the fact that Rani was an Empyrean, despite the fact that Rajir tells us she was the daughter of Radigan and Renala. Rajir could be mistaken or lying, but it's also possible people have just misinterpreted this description. However, I should mention that, in the opening intro, a picture of Rani appears on screen right as the narrator says the line, Soon, Merica's offspring, demigods all, claimed the shards of the Elden Ring. All the other pictures in this intro are tied directly to what the narrator is talking about, so it seems unlikely that this one would just be random filler. But that would imply that Rani is in some way Merica's offspring, which would really confuse things. The opening intro teases alternating shots of Merica and Radigan hammering the Elden Ring, so we know that Miyazaki isn't above putting some subtle clues into an intro like this. If Merica and Radigan were already conjoined during Radigan's marriage to Renala, and that conjoined being somehow gave birth to Rani, then that would satisfy the single god condition for her to be an Empyrean. I don't find this especially plausible, but it's a possibility. 
Radon's and Rikard's great runes tell us that the children of Renala and Radigan became demigod stepchildren after Radigan's union with Queen Merica, so at least the title of demigod can be retroactively applied instead of being an inherited characteristic. If Empyreans are born Empyreans, this would mean that Rani was an Empyrean before she became a demigod, which seems a bit strange to me, although I suppose it's possible. In my conversation with Radatosker on the Yggdrasil podcast, I laid out a theory that Merica selected Radagon as consort precisely because he gave birth to an Empyrean. If Rani was only chosen as an Empyrean after Radagon left Renala for Merica, that theory wouldn't make sense anymore, so I'm not entirely sure where I stand on this. According to the old legends, wolves are the shadows of Empyreans. But we only ever see two Empyreans with wolf shadows in game, Merica and Rani, with their shadows Malekith and Blythe respectively. We won't get into the Glomide Queen, but it's curious that Melania and Mikola don't appear to have shadows, while their father has a whole bunch of red wolves strewn about the world. It could be that Mikola's defection from the Golden Order has something to do with this, although that wouldn't explain why Blythe is still tied to Rani after she defected. It could also be that Mikola and Melania already dispatched their shadows in anticipation of their inevitable betrayal, or there could be nothing to it at all. Maybe one day, when I understand what the heck is going on with the Beastmen, I'll have clearer thoughts on this point. It's also interesting that the only Empyrean who isn't female, Mikola, is somewhat androgynous and strongly tied to a debatably female character, St. Trina. I have some loose thoughts about birth, and especially virgin birth, as it relates to Elden Ring, but I'll leave that for another video when I have something a bit clearer to say about it. Empyreans are chosen by their own two fingers as candidates to succeed Queen Merica and become the new god of the coming age. This implies three things. First, that the current age is about to end, or perhaps that the Greater Will wants it to end. Second, that the Greater Will believes it's necessary, or at least desirable, to replace Queen Merica in preparation for this new age. And third, that the criteria for selecting an Empyrean may have something to do with how this candidate will rule as a god, or possibly how they will dictate the order of this new age. Of course, it's possible that the coming age is already planned out by the Greater Will, and all it really wants is a vessel to put its plan into action. However, I don't find that very convincing. The various endings of the game imply that the order of the world can be reconfigured into a number of different ways, and that no one knows exactly what the best order is. Perhaps the Greater Will just wants to run some experiments and see what kind of order works best. It could also be the case that the Two Fingers have motivations of their own, and the coming age may not be in accordance with the wishes of the Greater Will at all. If it's true that the qualities of an Empyrean might shape their coming age, you might ask what sort of age Mikola would bring about. What sort of person is he? Mikola was at one point a Golden Order fundamentalist, in good graces with his father Radigan. Radigan appears to have been trapped with Merica when she was imprisoned inside the Erd Tree, so we can assume that this stage in Mikola's development was before the Elden Ring was shattered. At some point, Mikola abandoned the Golden Order because it couldn't cure his sister of her rot. Rot itself is an outer god. It's not clear what that means exactly, whether all instances of rot in the game are literally a manifestation of this outer god, or whether this outer god simply produces the rot we see, or something else. In any case, Mikola attempted to cure Melania's rot with unalloyed gold. Unalloyed gold means pure gold. An alloy is a mixture of elements. So for instance, if you have something made of 12 karat gold, that means it's actually an alloy of 50% gold and 50% other metals or impurities. Only true 24 karat gold could be considered unalloyed. This implies several things. First, that the golden order is in some way imperfect, impure. There's something mixed into the Golden Order that isn't gold, 
and that impurity is what prevents them from curing Melania's rot. It also means that the Golden Order isn't just unable to cure a simple disease, but that the reason it can't cure Melania is because this impurity prevents it from specifically warding off the influence of outer gods. Mikola crafted several unalloyed gold needles to ward away the meddling of outer gods. Although the one we find is unfinished, we can use it in the heart of the storm beyond time to cheat fate and remove the influence of the Flame of Frenzy. It's very interesting that this outer god hindering device takes the form of a needle that must be inserted into one's body. It may indicate that the unalloyed gold has to make contact with blood to take effect. Or it might be that the outer god hindering power of this needle requires the user to be reminded of a constant sharp pain. Or it might be connected to Radagon's gold sewing needle and his crosshatch pattern, which is sewn into the masks of the Carrion Preceptors. In Greek mythology, fate is determined by the Moirai, three sister goddesses who weave the threads of fate together on a great loom. A similar concept exists in Norse mythology with the Norns, three sisters who sit together at a well under the world tree, determining fate while weaving threads and carving runes. Perhaps the unalloyed gold needles are able to re-sew the threads of fate set by other outer gods. The unalloyed gold needle we find is unable to fully cure Millicent, perhaps because it's unfinished, or perhaps because in repairing it, Sage Gowrie imbued it with a different purpose. Either way, it's interesting what the needle actually does. Without it, Millicent will suffer and die fairly quickly. At the end of her quest, she deliberately takes the needle out in order to rot into nothingness. With the needle inserted, her suffering is lessened, she regains her composure, and regains part of her memory and purpose. However, although the rot stops eating away at her flesh and memory, it still has a transformative effect. Gowrie wants Millicent to be reborn as a Scarlet Valkyrie, and in order for this to happen, he needs Millicent to die with the needle in her flesh. Entropy has been an important theme in all FromSoft games, but the Scarlet Rot puts a slightly different spin on it. Scarlet Rot is described as a cycle of both decay and rebirth. Although the Gold Needle staves off the decay aspect, it seems that the Rot can still change Millicent in some way. When Millicent removes the Needle from her flesh, the description reads that it bears no trace of befouled blood but is faintly moist with dew, perhaps indicating that this vegetative transformation process has been taking place inside Millicent as a kind of potential, and only with her death is the full transformation realized. If unalloyed gold only prevents the decaying aspect of rot, but allows for the transformation and rebirth aspects, this helps explain a bit of what's going on inside the Halig tree. Mikola took a sapling of the Erd tree and watered it with his own blood to create the Halig tree. That in itself is interesting, because it might indicate that the impurity of the Golden Order has something to do with impure blood, for example, the cursed blood of the Omen. Blood and gold are strongly connected in Elden Ring, although in strange and enigmatic ways. Melania says specifically that her blood was rotted, perhaps indicating that rot spreads in people through their blood. This could also tie in with the Formless Mother and Moog's plan to make Mikla his consort, although I don't really know how. At some point in time, Melania's limbs rotted off, and Mikla replaced them with prosthetics made of unalloyed gold. If we take the story trailer as canon, this must have been before the Battle of Aeonia, because we can see that Melania already had her prosthetics at that point. Although adorned with unalloyed gold, Melania's rot was never fully cured, only forestalled. In the battle with Radon, Melania fought to a standstill, and in order to win the fight, she allowed the Scarlet Aeonia to bloom within her, infecting Radon with her rot. After this battle, she vanished and fled to the Halig Tree, waiting for Mikola's return. It's not clear exactly when Mikla was kidnapped by Moog, but there are two plausible theories that I have. 
One idea is that Mikola was kidnapped during Melania's southward march or the ensuing Battle of Ionia, because if we presume she was previously at the Halig Tree, Moog probably wouldn't have tried to kidnap Mikola while his undefeated sister was standing guard. Her departure would present him a chance opportunity. The second idea, which I find more plausible, is that Mikola was kidnapped before the Battle of Ionia, and that the entire reason for Melania's southward march is that she was in search of Mikola, perhaps even to find a way down into the Mogwin dynasty from the surface above. Melania doesn't otherwise seem to be motivated by a desire to acquire power or great runes, so it begs the question why she went on this tremendous journey with her army. There must have been a pretty good reason, and the only thing we really know about Melania's motivations is that she adores Mikola. Mikola and Melania are in some ways kind of mirror images of one another. Mikola inherited the white gold hair of his mother, as well as the intelligence and curiosity about more esoteric things. Melania, on the other hand, inherited the red hair of her father, as well as the passionate fervor and battle prowess. Melania is cursed to decay rapidly, as if time's effect on her body is multiplied. Mikola, on the other hand, is cursed to stay the same forever, as if time has no effect on his body. I have one crazy theory about Mikola and Melania, which comes from the echoes of Merica's spoken words to Radagon. Merica says, Thou art yet to become me, thou art yet to become a god. Let us be shattered both, mine other self. The line, let us be shattered both, is extremely peculiar. Radagon and Merica are presumably about to be conjoined into one body, but Merica is talking about shattering them. Perhaps in order for two people to become one, they must each split off part of themselves, and perhaps that's actually how Melania and Mikola were born. Melania created from the feminine aspect of Radagon, and Mikola from the masculine aspect of Merica. That would also explain why they're both afflicted with conditions. They're both only half people. Sir Gideon Ofnir tells us that Mikola is a shardbearer, but we never find Mikola's great rune. We do find Melania's rune, however, and examining this rune leads us to some interesting speculation. If we look at the great runes received in game, there appear to be three sets of doubles. Rikard's rune resembles Radon's, although it's got a squiggly bit, probably because of his blasphemy. Moog and Morgoth's runes fit together, as if they're really two parts of one rune. These doubles make a certain kind of sense because the Shardbearers are siblings, but that implies some confusing questions about Melania's rune, because it resembles the Great Rune of the Unborn. The name Great Rune of the Unborn is somewhat reminiscent of Mikola's eternal youth, although perhaps Mikola could be better described as eternally born rather than unborn. The Great Rune of the Unborn is also smaller than the other Great Runes, which seems to parallel Mikola's youthful appearance. If similar-looking Great Runes are shared by siblings, that would indicate that the Great Rune of the Unborn is actually Mikola's rune, or was intended for Mikola. But this doesn't really make sense. The Great Rune of the Unborn dwells within the Amber Egg that was Radagon's gift to Renala, whereas we know that Mikola was born of the conjoined form of Radagon and Merica. If Radagon was not yet conjoined with Merica when he left Renala, this would mean that Mikola was born after the Great Rune of the Unborn was removed from the Elden Ring. More confusing is why Merica would allow this Great Rune to be removed from the Elden Ring in the first place, and then gifted by a mere champion to his wife, who was a former enemy of the Golden Order. It's possible that the Great Rune of the Unborn was never in the Elden Ring to begin with. It's also possible that everything to do with Mikola's Great Rune was removed from the game, and that all of this speculation leads nowhere, as there is considerable cut content related to him. Although Mikola was cursed with eternal youth, he seems to have at least partially overcome this. The body we see in the cocoon in Mogwin Palace is clearly an adult rather than a child. Moog wished to raise Mikola to full godhood, so it's possible Moog is responsible for Mikola's growth, but I don't think so. All throughout the Halig Tree are similar cocoons, although these don't appear in any other place related to Rot. This suggests that these cocoons are a particular construction of Mikola and his Halig Tree. 
However, the concept art in the opening intro shows Moog carrying Mikola in infant form, with viscous material dripping from his body, suggesting that Moog took Mikola in infant form from inside the cocoon, and only later did Mikola grow. If the cocoon is Mikola's creation, perhaps Moog retrieved it separately as well, or perhaps when Mikola was brought to Mogwin, he generated a new cocoon. From cocoons emerge butterflies, and both Mikola and Melania are connected with butterflies. According to myth, the Aeonian butterflies were once the wings of the goddess of Rot herself, which is the same form Melania takes when she is reborn in her second phase. The nascent butterfly appears as if it's just emerged from its cocoon for its entire life, meaning that it appears eternally youthful. All of this suggests to me that Mikola attempted to use the transformative element of rot, purified of its decaying aspect, to design a cocoon in which he could metamorphose into some different being, perhaps the god of the coming age. What kind of being would this new evolved Mikola be, and what would be the reason for this transformation? At this point, I think it could be illuminating, or at least interesting, to examine some similarities between Mikla and a character named Griffith from the manga Berserk. Berserk has been a huge influence on Miyazaki going back to Demon Souls and Dark Souls, but Elden Ring takes much more inspiration from Berserk than any previous game. In a moment, I'm going to summarize some major story elements from Berserk, but if you have not read it, I seriously recommend skipping this part of the video. Berserk is an amazing story, and like FromSoft games, it's best experienced going in blind. So fair warning, spoilers ahead, and you can jump to this timecode to skip this section. The central antagonist in Berserk is a man named Griffith. He's a young mercenary leader with long white hair and childish features. He has an ambitious dream, and because of that dream and his natural irresistible charisma, his people follow him with an almost obsessive loyalty. His strategic genius is unparalleled, and he never loses. Until one day. His best fighter and the closest thing he has to a friend, a swordsman named Guts, defeats the man who never knew defeat. Griffith is ruined by this, and shortly after he's captured and held in a dungeon in the Tower of Rebirth for a year stewing obsessively about the man who beat him while being subjected to horrendous and unrecoverable torture. He's eventually rescued, but with his tendons cut, his tongue removed, and his body in disrepair, he no longer has any hope of achieving his dream. However, Griffith's fate leads him to a lake where, by chance, his long-lost talisman, the Crimson Bailet, appears. As the sun is swallowed by an eclipse, the area is thrown into a nightmare world, inhabited by hundreds of demon apostles, led by the God Hand. There are five fingers on the God Hand, but only four members are present. The four demons offer Griffith the fifth position, a position of ultimate power he can use to achieve his dream. All he needs to do is sacrifice all of his friends and comrades. Griffith chooses to make the sacrifice. The God Hand closes around him, and in his cocoon, he begins to metamorphose. After experiencing a vision of his last crystallized tear and a swirling ocean of dark souls, he emerges reborn as Femto, a powerful winged being with all the skill and ambition of Griffith but without any of the humanity. Although Femto only resides in the spirit world for the time being, it isn't the last we see of Griffith. Later on, the events of the Eclipse are strangely mirrored at the Tower of Conviction. At the same time, all throughout the lands, people dream of a savior called the Hawk of Light. Casca's demon child, mutated by Femto's perverse influence, is consumed by an egg-shaped apostle, who became a living Baelit in order to replace the current world with a new, more perfect world, in accordance with the guidance of a greater will. Inside the egg-shaped apostle, the demon child dreams of this perfect world. As dawn breaks, the child is reborn as Griffith, only it's a more perfect version of Griffith, more beautiful, almost feminine. 
Later on, the spirit realm and the physical realm are merged together into a new world called Fantasia. In this new world, Griffith rules over Falconia, a kingdom in which demons and men work together. His intention is to create an empire where humanity can prosper. However, this new form of Griffith has a drawback. On the full moon, his hair turns black and he turns into a small child, living a dream of nostalgia. Unfortunately, the manga ends here, cut short by Kentaro Mura's untimely death. We don't know where the manga would have gone next, but regardless, the influence on Elden Ring and Mikola specifically is, I think, pretty clear, and we can try and use these parallels to make some educated guesses about Mikola. One has to be very careful bringing in external sources to explain what's happening in Elden Ring. While Berserk is clearly a source of inspiration, the story of Elden Ring exists on its own merit. Some parts of Elden Ring might strongly resemble Berserk, but that doesn't mean we can draw firm conclusions based on other parts of Berserk. There are many things about Griffith that don't resemble Mikola at all. That being said, I still think there's enough associations present to give us some clues about Mikola's more mysterious aspects, Saint Trina and the Eclipse in particular. Cut content all but confirms that Saint Trina is Mikola, or at least a form of Mikola. But regardless of whether you treat this cut content as canon, the retail version indicates that, at the very least, these characters are strongly related. Saint Trina is described as an enigmatic and androgynous figure whose appearance was as sudden as their disappearance. Saint Trina's torch depicts Saint Trina, but in adult form, somewhat unnervingly. This could mean that the depiction is unnerving because Saint Trina is in adult form, or it could just mean that the depiction is unnerving regardless, which it is because the image of Saint Trina has a single eye in the middle of her forehead. There are three things this single eye could connect to. The face of the fell god has one eye, which could be related to the fact that this one-eyed Trina is appearing on a torch, so there's some connection with fire. However, that's pretty loose. Another possible connection could be with Godwin's mutated corpse, which has a strange nub in the middle of what might be his forehead, which could be a nascent third eye. But again, this is very loose. A more likely connection could be with the sigil of Sir Gideon Ofnir, which depicts a central eye surrounded by three smaller eyes. The curvy lines in the design of the sigil also somewhat resemble St. Trina's hair on the torch. However, this is still a pretty loose connection, as there's almost nothing to connect Gideon and St. Trina. Gideon is obviously interested in discovering the secrets of Mikola. In fact, he's obsessed to the point of massacring a whole village in order to get some clues as to Mikola's whereabouts. But I think this says more about Gideon's obsession with knowledge in general, rather than indicating he has some special connection to Mikola or St. Trina. Trina's eye could also just be a representation of some kind of enhanced spiritual vision. Many Eastern spiritual traditions depict enlightened beings with a third eye in the middle of their forehead. The third eye, or the inner eye, symbolizes one's ability to see past the mundane world into a deeper, more mystical world. Some people have theorized that the third eye is actually the pineal gland, which governs circadian rhythms and sleep, which obviously connects with St. Trina. This is purely speculative, but I believe that St. Trina never existed in the physical world. She only appeared in a dream shared by many people. Although there's nothing to suggest this besides Trina's association with dreams and the berserk plotline about the Hawk of Light, I think there are enough similarities to make this a reasonable guess. This isn't stated in game, but if St. Trina only appeared when Mikola entered the Halig Tree and began his long slumber, it would make a certain kind of sense that Trina was a kind of dream of Mikola's, a dream that reached out into people's minds, perhaps a kind of avatar or premonition of the form that would soon emerge from his cocoon. St. Trina might actually tie back to the great rune of the unborn, Young Academy scholars were repeatedly birthed anew by the Amber Egg, although their birth was not without imperfections. The juvenile scholar cap says that rebirth is as sleep to them, 
and with each awakening, memory fades into oblivion. The idea of imperfect rebirth and sleep is strongly connected to Mikola and St. Trina, and it's also interesting that repeated rebirths cause one's memories to fade. Memory seems to be one of the things that the Scarlet Rot affects. In order to birth people anew, the Amber Egg requires a larval tear, the core of a silver tear. Silver tears and mimic tears appear to be part of a plan by the Nox to create a Lord of Night. Although they never succeeded, it's possible they were able to create some kind of life, perhaps the Albanorix. Throughout the Eternal Cities, you can see statues or possibly petrified beings with faces very similar to the male first-generation Albanorix. The first-generation Albanorix are, like Rinala's Sweetings, flawed, unable to use their legs. The word Albanoric means white gold, and they bleed a whitish silver blood. It's also worth noting that St. Trina's sword is made of silver. Rinala herself seems very Albanoric-ish. She's bigger than a normal human, similar to the towering sister in the apostate derelict, and her legs don't seem to work anymore, which is a fate shared by all the first-generation Albanorics. There appear to be connections between Mikola and the Albanorix and Rinala and Rebirth, but I'm not sure exactly what it all means. I hope that some of you will theorize about these observations in the comments. I really appreciated the comments in my last video, and it got me thinking about things in lots of new ways. For now, let's leave this part and continue on to the final mystery of Mikola, the Eclipse. If you played Dark Souls 3, you were probably confused about many things. Why are there statues of a primordial serpent with the body of an angel in Lothric, but different statues of a primordial serpents with lizard bodies in the Ringed City? What's the deal with angels, anyway? Are they pilgrim butterflies, or those things in the Dreg Heap? And why are those even two different things? Why does returning the Lords of Cinder to their molding thrones require defeating Prince Lothric, who didn't ever link the fire. Who is Yorshka? Why are there three versions of Firelink Shrine? So on and so forth. If these questions bugged you enough, you may have come across some of the discoveries of data miners discussed in various podcasts and videos, like from Sinclair Lore or Lance McDonald. The picture painted of the early versions of Dark Souls 3 is radically different to what we got in the retail version, much more apocalyptic, with an almost completely different storyline. In particular, the Eclipse was going to play a much bigger role, involving a mechanic similar to world tendency in Demon Souls. Upon encountering a Puss of Man, players could either cleanse the Dark Spirit with fire, creating a new bonfire, or submit to the Dark Spirit, causing the sun to be eclipsed for that area, and possibly allowing invasions to occur. The final boss was actually this guy, our old friend Pontiff Sullivan, although at the time he was a completely different character, internally named the Old King of the Eclipse. Sullivan's design, with its pale, feeble body, root-like decorations, and half-formed black wings, strongly resembles Griffith during his transformation into Femto. Why am I talking about Dark Souls 3? Elden Ring is not Dark Souls, but Miyazaki likes to play with a lot of similar tropes throughout his games. We often see something that wasn't fleshed out in one game taken and developed in the next. Although we don't know exactly what the Eclipse would have been in the original plan for Dark Souls 3, in the retail version, the Eclipse appears as an enormous dark sign in the sky. The dark sign was a brand which appeared on the flesh of humans, a seal of fire that kept the destructive power of humanity's dark desires at bay and produced a curse of undeath. In Elden Ring, the symbol for the Eclipse bears a strong resemblance to the Mending Rune of the Death Prince, a mark made of two hallowbrands which were each carved into the flesh of Rani and Godwin, causing both to die half-deaths. At one point, Mikola wanted Godwin to die a true death, but the dialogue from the spirit atop Castle Soul suggests that maybe that plan changed, perhaps when Mikola abandoned the Golden Order. The spirit says that the sun has not been swallowed, and your comrade remains soulless, implying that if the eclipse took place, Godwin would gain a soul somehow. 
This is confirmed by the other spirit in Castle Soul, who says, Frigid son of soul, surrender yourself to the eclipse. Grant life to the soulless bones, implying that the eclipse will grant life to Godwin. In Berserk, the eclipse was a meeting of the spirit world and the physical world. It created a temporal junction point where fate wasn't predetermined. In Dark Souls 3, the Eclipse represented the seal of fire which confined the Dark Soul of man. I still don't have entirely clear thoughts about this, but my best speculation at the moment is that, because of the current order and the Knight of the Black Knives, Godwin's soul is somehow trapped by or in the sun, and that the Eclipse would somehow bypass this order and allow his soul to return to his body. I really only have about 15% conviction in this theory, but it's my best idea at the moment. I should also just point out that soul and soul are homonyms, so make of that what you will. The sun in Eclipse is said to be the symbol of the wandering mausoleums where the soulless demigods slumber. It's curious that there appear to be more soulless demigods than just Godwin. In the story trailer, Rani says about the Knight of the Black Knives that demigods began to fall, starting with Godwin the Golden, conveying that the Black Knife assassins killed many demigods, not just Godwin and Rani. It's interesting that we've never heard anything about who these other demigods were, or why their bodies didn't vegetate in the way that Godwin's did. It could be that Godwin's malformed body is just a result of being buried at the roots of the Erd Tree, or perhaps the Great Tree. It could also be because the heads of these demigods have been cut off. Or it could be that the reason the mausoleums walk is to somehow prevent these bodies from stagnation and overgrowth. A spirit in the Weeping Peninsula refers to the soulless demigod inside the mausoleum as the unwanted child of Queen Merica. This could be interpreted in two ways. One, it might indicate that Merica was responsible for the death of this demigod, or in some way involved in planning the Night of the Black Knives. I'm not particularly convinced by this, because the story trailer says that Merica was driven to the brink. Although it's possible she was driven to the brink by something else, the simplest reading of this trailer would be that it was Godwin's death which drove her to the brink. A second interpretation of this unwanted child line relates to one of Merica's echoes, Merica says, Hear me, demigods, my children beloved. Make of thyselves that which ye desire, be it a lord, be it a god. But should ye fail to become aught at all, ye will be forsaken, amounting only to sacrifices. So it seems like Merica wants her children to make the most of themselves, but if they don't, they'll be sacrificed. Maybe the reason we've never heard about any of these other demigods is because they didn't make anything of themselves, and so they became sacrifices. But that doesn't necessarily mean that Merica was in on the plan to kill them, just that she knew what the consequences of them failing to become anything would be. In my initial playthrough, I thought there was no sun in the sky, but a small sun does appear in Elden Ring. It's just usually overpowered by the light of the Erd Tree or hidden by clouds. The Sun Realm Shield, dropped by certain warriors among those who live in death, depicts the Seat of the Sun, a city crowned by an enormous sun. The warriors who drop these shields are girded with swords and armor not obtainable in-game, and the designs appear to be unrelated to any other faction's weaponry or armor that we come across, perhaps indicating that these warriors fought in an age long ago. Perhaps the Erd Tree supplanted the Sun in some way. I've even been playing with the idea that the Crucible itself was the sun, but that's a bit crazy and I won't go into it for now. In the final boss arena, we're transported to a lake in sunrise or sunset, although no sun can be seen. This image also appears faintly in the menu, although it's not clear whether the reflection in the water is caused by the sun or the Erd Tree or nothing at all. The memory of Grace also strongly resembles the reflection of a sun in the water. This could be a representation of Grace guiding the Tarnished back to the lands between over the Sea of Fog. It could also tie into the various connections between death or undeath and water. Godwin's body develops a fishtail, spirit jellyfish can be found all over the lands between, 
Tibia mariners ride boats on a kind of magical water, and as I mentioned in my previous video, there are a number of very mystical locations which are bodies of water. In addition, the Mikla and Trina lilies are water lilies. Elphael and the Halig tree are separated from the lands between by water, and perhaps most importantly, a tree must be watered in order to survive. What any of this means, I'm not entirely sure. The more I delve into the lore of Elden Ring, the more confused I get. But at the same time, I get a stronger feeling that it all makes sense somehow. It's all connected. I just don't have the clarity to understand it yet. I'd like to finish with a prediction about the DLC. At this point, we don't know if there will be a DLC, but personally, I doubt that FromSoft will break their track record, especially considering how popular Elden Ring is. Many people have been speculating that the DLC will involve Mikla in some way, because much of the cut content relates to Mikla, and people speculate that they might use the DLC to fill in some of these gaps. I'd be very surprised if this is the case, though. The DLCs for previous games have never really been attempts to complete the base game. They always attempt to tell a different story. Out of all the games they've made, Elden Ring is the most complete, the most finished. So I don't think Miyazaki is going to be motivated at all to try and fill in gaps or explain what happens in the base game. If anything, the DLC will probably create even more mysteries and more confusion. If I had to predict what the DLC will be about, I think it will be a completely new story, but one that explores the same broad themes that the base game does. The dichotomy of chaos versus order, or regression and causality, the desire for knowledge and power, and the cycle of life and death. There will probably be characters in the DLC that resemble characters in the base game. There may even be someone who strongly parallels Mikola. But I wouldn't get your hopes up that the DLC will explain Mikla or make it clearer what's going on. If anything, it'll be the opposite. Thank you all for watching, and especially thank you to all the new subscribers coming in from my last video. I'm pretty new to all of this, so I'd really appreciate if you guys have any input on how to make these videos even better, or what you'd like to see from this channel going forward. YouTube doesn't give me notifications for every comment, but I try to check and read every one and respond to the ones I have something to say to, so feedback of any kind is much appreciated. With all that said, thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.